Well, hi everybody, and welcome to Tea with Jesus for this week. As you can see, I am back down in Florida and um, enjoying the sunshine a lot. Now, I had some that I had recorded um, up in, in Virginia that I really want to use this week. So you'll see me go back and forth a little bit. I'll be um, sharing some stuff uh, from last week and new stuff for this week. But I had recorded some things I really wanted to try to go ahead and use this week. We are in chapter 12 of Hebrews. We had really talked about things through verse 4 of chapter 12. And I'm going to go ahead and I think we'll be able to do 5 through 13 uh, for this week. So I'm going to start out by reading that in my New Living Translation. And then, like I said, you'll see me sometimes here in the sunshine and sometimes up at our home in Virginia. Okay, this will be Hebrews 12, and I'm going to read um, 5 through 13. And have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, My child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline, and don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who is never disciplined by its father? If God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you are illegitimate and are not really his children at all. Since we respected our earthly fathers and who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the Father of our spirits and live forever? For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how. But God's discipline is always good for us, so that we might share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it is happening. It's painful. But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. So take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. Mark out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall, but become strong. Before we dig into these scriptures, I do want to go back and just look at verses 3 and 4 in Hebrews 12. It says here, It says here, think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. After all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. Of course, that's speaking of Jesus. I'm trying to think of all the hostility that he endured from sinful people. And now we're going to take just a little bit and we're going to be going back up to Virginia. I saw um, a video of a guy who preaches on the streets all over the world. Um, and he would um, take Isaiah 53, and this was especially poignant when he was in Israel, but he'd take Isaiah 53 and have people read it, and, and then he would tell them, do you know of anybody that that might fit? And read Isaiah 53. I want to just challenge you to read it, because it's the most phenomenal description in the Old Testament of what Jesus did for us. And you know, time after time, even for people who obviously had not had faith in Jesus, time after time they'd say, well, yeah, I know of someone, it would be Jesus. I've heard enough about Jesus to know that that fits him. And um, I thought that was really cool that they could, even, even uh, with their, their lack of relationship with the Lord, they recognized this about this man Jesus, that that's what he had endured says here in verse 5 and 6, And have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, My child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline. Don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who's never disciplined by his father? If God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you are illegitimate and are not really his children at all. Now, since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the father of our spirits and live forever? 
Let's take just a moment and go to Proverbs 3. I just want to read 11 and 12. The writer of Hebrews knew his Old Testament. I just want you to see that that's where this has come from. My child, don't reject the Lord's discipline and don't be upset when he corrects you. For the Lord corrects those he loves just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. So back in Proverbs, um, this was spoken and then the author of Hebrews has said it again here in verses 5 and 6 in Hebrews 12. You know, discipline uh, brings freedom. Um, it also protects us. I I've heard uh, someone say one time that raising a child is like putting a child in a bumper car track. They're learning how to drive, but they've got bumpers all around them so they can't really hurt themselves or somebody else. And maturity comes when someone can get behind the wheel of a car on a mountain road, and even though there's no bumpers, they're not going to go in the other lane of traffic. They're not going to go off the side of the road. They will remain in the correct road because they've learned the discipline of how to be a good driver. It is wisdom and it's love on the part of someone who has authority over someone else's life. Uh, whether that is as a parent or some leader of a group or however it is, um, it is wisdom and love to recognize that these younger ones, that the ones that you are in charge of, need to learn how to be stronger, need to learn how to do the right thing, need to have discipline. And if they really start straying away, they have to be corrected and brought back. And if they become very rebellious, then there has to be consequences so they don't end up destroying themselves. That's love that says that. I, I trained my dog because I didn't want her running out in front of a car on the street. Um, my mom ran into a really tough situation when I was little because I was this happy-go-lucky, grinning little thing that didn't think anybody would ever hurt me. And I'd just walk out in the street. And she spanked me and, and did everything she could when I was little to try to get me to understand that I had to stay with her and I couldn't scamper out into the street. She said, the cars will hurt you. And I'd tell her, they're not going to hurt me. They love me. That was really the way my personality was. And mom had to do a really difficult thing one time. Um, turned out that a, a cat had gotten hit. And she took me over when I was little and she says, honey, do you see what happens when you don't listen and when you get in front of a car, that car didn't mean to hit this cat, but that's what happened. The cat went right out in front of it. And apparently, you know, I, I was really tender hearted and it really tore me up. But she finally got through to me. She finally was able to discipline me to understand that there was a reason that I needed to listen to her. Um, discipline from someone who loves you, it is, it is strengthening, it is freeing, and it is protective. All right, as we look at verse 7, and it says, As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who is never disciplined by his father? I'm going to take a minute and just go to Deuteronomy 8, starting in verse 1. I think I'm going to go ahead and read like these 10 verses. And Moses is really trying to... Um, to express to all the people how important and beneficial it is to simply obey God's commands. Be careful to obey all the commands I'm giving you today. Then you will live and multiply and you will enter and occupy the land God swore to give your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for those 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. Yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna, a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone. Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And Jesus quoted that when he was tempted many years later on. For all these 40 years, your clothes didn't wear out and your feet didn't blister or swell. Think about it. Just as a parent disciplines a child, the Lord your God disciplines you for your own good. So obey the commands of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and fearing him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land of flowing streams and pools of water, with fountains and springs that gush out in the valleys and hills. It is a land of wheat and barley, of grapevines, fig trees and pomegranates, of olive oil and honey. 
It is a land where food is plentiful and nothing is lacking. It's a land where iron is as common as stone and copper is abundant in the hills. When you've eaten your fill, be sure to praise the Lord your God for the good land He has given you. And I'm going to go ahead and read verse 11. But, in, but that is the time to be careful. Beware that in your plenty you do not forget the Lord your God and disobey His commands, regulations, and decrees that I'm giving you today. So he's just letting them know that it is wise and going to have wonderful results if they just simply trust God and listen to Him. And it was truly because of what He spoke in like bringing manna to them that they were fed. He was very willing to take good care of them. He just wanted them to trust him and to listen to what he had, what he wanted them to do. So let's look at the last verses we have here, starting in verse 8 through 13. If God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you are illegitimate and not really his children at all. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the Father of our spirits and live forever? For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how. But God's discipline is always, always good for us, so that we might share in His holiness. And no discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. It's painful. But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. It's worth it. And I love this. So take a new grip on your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. Mark out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall, but become strong. Let's go to James 3. And we're going to read 17 and 18. And this is talking about listening to good counsel, knowing that God knows so much more than we do. This is such a beautiful passage of scripture here. But the wisdom from above, from God, the wisdom from above is first of all pure. It is also peace loving, gentle at all times and willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. It's so worth it to listen to the wonderful, wise, gentle, peaceful, true wisdom that comes from God. And in Isaiah 35, 3, um, I like this. I want to show you this. It's kind of fun. Um, once again, the writer of Hebrews is referring back to a specific scripture in the Old Testament about you know strengthening is just getting stronger again um, it says here in verse 12 so take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees and in Isaiah 35 3 with this news strengthen those who have tired hands and encourage those who have weak knees just be strong and encouraged in the Lord. And then the last thing it talks about here is marking out a straight path for your feet. So that those who are weak and lame will not fall, but they will become strong. I want to go to uh, 1 Peter 5 and read 8 and 9. You know, the enemy is really trying to cause grief to any part of the body of Christ, but there are many um, in other parts of the world that are under terrible persecution. But even where we're not under such incredibly bad persecution, the enemy is still out to do everything he can to destroy what God wants to do in our life. Verses 8 and 9, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your Christian brothers and sisters all over the world are going through the same kind of suffering you are. Um, that we all, as the body of Christ, are in this together. And we want to be as encouraging and strengthening for um, other Christians as we can, especially if they're really young in the Lord or they are really struggling. And let's go to Proverbs 4, and read 25 through 27. Look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. 
Mark out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the safe path. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. And, and help others uh, to know the path that the Lord would have for them too. We don't want others to fall. We want them to become strong. You know, God will bring what I love to call clarity to us. We'll come to understand how wise, really wise, His leading is in our lives. And we've got to always remember that we have a choice. It's the enemy that wants to take our choice away. It makes us feel like we've just, we can't survive without doing something that will, will uh, not please God or will dishonor Him. That we're just sort of, just don't have the strength to do anything else. Well, no, that's not true. With God's help, we can always have a choice. And we can uh, choose to say, God, how would you have me respond in this situation? You know, it's hard to hang in there when we're, we've just got challenges in our life and things that we don't understand or that don't really make sense. And there's a little story, I may have shared this before, and it is just a story. But it's of a young man who wants to serve God. He's excited to serve God. And so one day he feels like the Lord is telling him what he wants him to start doing. And the Lord said, okay, there is a great big boulder out there. And I need you to go and I need you to move that boulder over into another place. And the young man said, wow, boulder. But he said, I know you're going to give me the strength to do it, Lord. So he goes over and he pushes and that boulder won't budge. It's not going anywhere. And he pushes and he pushes and he leans and he pushes. Pretty soon he's feeling like, you know what? That's got to have just been an idea in my own head. That can't have been God. So when he gets home, he's like, Lord, I'm sorry. I must have really misunderstood you. So I'm open to what you want me to do. And um, I, you know, I, I know that wasn't you. And the Lord said, my son, I want you to move the boulder. So he says, all right. I mean, you're going to have to give me strength for this. So he goes out and day after day, he's just pushing on this boulder over and over and leaning and shoving and getting his back against it and pushing with his feet and everything he can think of. And it's not moving. And day after day, God does not change what he's saying. Day after day, he just wants him to go back. And after a while, he becomes pretty discouraged. And he feels like I got to be doing something wrong. I, I just, I, I, this has got to be me. I got to be doing something wrong. And so he's just, he's, t he's very tired. He's having a hard time sleeping. But all he knows is that he's supposed to keep out and keep pushing on this big old boulder. And finally, he just starts getting mad. And he's like, I don't, I don't understand this. You seem to be wanting me to do this, Lord. And I feel like an idiot. And I'm not doing anything for your kingdom. And I'm exhausted. And I just don't want to do this anymore. And he just stomps back home and God just gently says, son, I want you to go over and I want you to move that boulder. So finally he says, all right, I don't want to disobey you. You're God. I love you, but I'm not happy about this. But he goes out and he pushes on the dumb boulder and he pushes and pushes. Finally, his heart just kind of gives way and he's like, Lord, you know what? I love you and I trust you and you are much wiser than, than me. So if you want me to push on this dumb rock that's never going to move for the rest of my life, I'll do it. I don't understand, but I'll do it. And he just keeps pushing on the boulder. Quite a few weeks go by. Finally, he gets home one day. He's exhausted and he goes to sleep. When he wakes up the next morning, God said, okay, you're done. And he goes, I'm done. I'm fit. I didn't accomplish anything. I didn't do anything. I don't understand, Lord. And God said, my son, I want you to go over and look in that mirror. So the young man goes over and he looks at himself in the mirror. And he realizes that he has got muscles all through his chest and neck and his arms and his legs have muscles. He has really gotten strong muscles. And he's like, whoa. He said, I didn't even realize. And God said, now, my son. Now you're ready for the next thing that I have for you. We, we just don't know what all God may have in mind. I really want us to see 
that it is not a bad thing when God has certain ways that he wants us to act and certain things that he knows we need to do in our life. He is smarter than us. When he says something is wrong, it's because he's got a good reason. If he says something is right, even though we don't want to do it, he has got a good reason. And I really think that when we think about our lives and we think about, well, what is it that God asks of me where, you know, I, I need to be disciplined and I need to obey him and listen. Um, that, to me, some of the biggest hurdles come when we have to be kind to someone who's not kind to us. You know, there are people in the world facing unbelievable persecution. They're dying for the name of Jesus. We are barely touching on persecution in our culture yet. But when people are mean to us, and they can be, and when people are cruel, can we respond with love? Can we remain kind? Um, you know, God will give us the strength, but we always have to make the choice. God does give us choice, and we have to make that choice. Can we forgive when something seems unforgivable and it makes us so angry? Can we take honest anger that people do get and be able to just deal with it and give it to the Lord? Not pretending we're fine, but going through it like a storm and saying, God, you're going to have to help me because my choice is to respond with forgiveness and you're going to have to help me do it. But I will get through this storm, even though it's hard to forgive, to be patient in situations in our life where we are suffering or other people are unendurable to us or a circumstance just feels endless. Being patient. Can, can we make a choice with God's help to choose to love. God does it. That is underlying everything God is, is this unbelievably powerful love. And when we face situations that are not lovable, not forgivable, not nice, cruel, malicious, irritating, whatever it is, can we grow in Him to the point where we will Take a deep breath and stop and choose and say, I will respond the way you want, Lord. And I will be kind to my enemies. It doesn't mean we're supposed to, to stay in a relationship where someone's beating us up all the time. We have to make wise decisions to remove ourselves from danger. But we can do things with kindness. We can do things with forgiveness. And trusting that no matter what we have to endure in this life, God will be with us. And we will get through that storm. And we have his presence always. And we are looking towards something so glorious as he takes all of us into eternity with him. Who cares how mean a human being is? If they die lost, they are going to suffer horribly and they've just been a jerked around puppet in the hands of the enemy anyway if we want to be mad at somebody we can be mad at the devil we can be mad at the enemy people need redeeming anybody can be redeemed he redeemed us he forgave us he endures us he loves us he likes us he wants us with him and by his power and strength, we can extend that same kindness and love to others. Even when sometimes that can be the most challenging thing we can face. So I, I do want you to go and read Isaiah 53. Start with the end of 52, where that paragraph is, and then go into 53. Um, and let's just remember why Jesus did everything he did. It's for us. And no matter what we have to endure, whatever discipline comes in our life, it's from love because God wants us to be, for one thing, steering away from danger and destruction, but also to be as strong in him, as humble and as real, and as reliant on his strength as we can be. Because then we can be a light in this really dark world. And we can know that someday 
in heaven. There will be those who were drawn to that light and are finding eternal joy instead of eternal sorrow and suffering. How could anything be more wonderful? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the beauty that is surrounding me. I don't take it for granted at all. And Lord, help us to become wise enough to really live our lives acknowledging that you are far wiser and that you know no matter what you know what's best and that no matter just like with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego going into the fiery furnace Lord even if we would die we will still serve you we still know that you are our God and Lord I pray that we can have a heart that is going to be delighting in serving you and obeying you and knowing that you're going to carry the burdens you're going to give us the strength and that it's always better to just simply hear you and see what you've said to us in your word and obey Lord I just pray that as people are ch challenged so greatly in their life with being hurt and being mistreated that you will give profound strength to be able to walk in forgiveness that you will set them free of what the enemy wants to bind them with, but that they will be able to choose to love and forgive. The Lord, people will choose to be reconciled. And the Lord, we will choose to reach out with hope and love to a world that hates you, but needs to know about you so badly. So Lord, bring provision and healing. Lord, bring jobs. Um, bring your hope, bring the joy of your presence into so many lives and I pray that we will proclaim your good news Lord in Jesus name Amen I love you guys and I will see you next week thank you for joining with me today bye bye